Hey, good evening. I'm going to call this uh, Perrysburg Board of Education regular board meeting of Monday, November 21st to order. Uh, we will start with roll call, please, Mr. Druyer. Ms. Larimer. Doc, Mr. Pullman. Here. Dr. Reffert. Here. Mrs. Eubank. Here. Mr. Bennington. Here. And Ms. Larimer, let me know. She's going to be a little late tonight, so be uh, listening for that door over there. So if you'd please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Perrysburg Schools welcomes you to the Commodore Building, and we thank you for attending tonight's Board of Education meeting. We care about the safety of our students, staff, families, and guests. Please note that there are exits on both sides of the east and west sides of the cafeteria. In case of an emergency, an AED is located just outside the cafeteria doors. You are located at 140 East Indiana Avenue. Thank you for joining us tonight and supporting Perrysburg Schools. With the safety briefing done, I will uh, accept a motion to adopt the proposed agenda. So moved. Mr. Pullman? Second. Dr. Reffert? And roll call, please. Mr. Pullman? Yes. Dr. Refford. Yes. Mrs. Eubank. Yes. Mr. Bennington. Yes. Item three on the agenda, uh, Board of Education recognition. We have three nice uh, agenda items for recognition. Mr. Hassler, you want to lead us through those? Um, sure. Um, first, I'd like to, to introduce uh, Mr. Cooper, uh, principal at Fort Meigs Elementary, and, um, and also invite uh, Mr. Daryl Edge up to the podium with Mr. Cooper. Um, this is, um, we look forward to this each year. It's the um, Fall 2022 um, Shining Star Award. We appreciate uh, the Grafune Agency, Fritz Grafune, for, for um, continuing to allow us to recognize outstanding staff members. And, and with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Cooper. Good evening, Board of Education, Mr. Hostler and uh, Mrs. Price and everyone in attendance. Uh, I am honored uh, today to be here uh, with Daryl Edge. Uh, we've spent many hours together today already, so uh, I'm happy to be here. If you don't know anything about Daryl, uh, Daryl has been with the district uh, seven years, I believe. Yeah, so he used to be a fourth grade teacher at Fort Meigs Elementary School, highly regarded in terms of um, respect with students, with staff, uh, and also with our parents and community. One of the highest uh, recommended uh, teachers that we get through the um, through emails every year and, and what he does for us. Uh, thank you to the board for allowing us to get full-time deans this year. Uh, Daryl uh, has jumped into that role extremely well. Uh, he's taken a lot of things off the plate and he runs with things and has a lot of great ideas that he's already given back to our Jack Away community and to our uh, staff in general. Um, he was nominated multiple times from what I understand, um, and a couple of his nominations are here today. Uh, Mrs. Walland, who is one of our playground monitors, uh, was unable to be here today, and I understand uh, Kim Shoemaker had an emergency that she had to step out, so I'll read them. Uh, Mrs. Walland uh, says, Mr. Edge has been wonderful to work for. He literally makes coming out to work every day enjoyable. He is kind, respectful, and so easy to talk to. I cannot say how great he is with all the children on the playground. He literally comes outside and onto the playground every single day and asks if we are doing okay. He plays basketball, football, and sometimes he walks around and talks to the kids. He is a true example of a team player. I nominate Mr. Edge for this award because he does have, not have an easy job but he makes it look so easy, and you can tell he truly enjoys his job. One of the things that Daryl has instituted in our Jack and Way program is the ability to uh, win different types of awards, which involve playing basketball against Mr. Cooper, uh, who is a little bit older than Mr. Edge, so I, I recruit Mr. Edge to play against kids. Uh, I will say Daryl does not play defense, uh, but he does like to try to score. Uh, he did pull a hamstring. I understand that, So, but we are undefeated. We are 3-0 at this time. Ms. Shoemaker is one of our bus drivers in the district. Uh, she said, since Daryl has switched jobs from teacher to dean of students at Fort Meigs, I've seen him out on the playground playing with the, many I'm sorry, with the kids many times at the end of the day. The kids love having him out there. 
He also makes his presence on the out on the bus line at the start and at the end of the day, greeting all the kids and available for and is available for discipline issues. Daryl has been quick to help with the situation, um, so when a situation comes to his attention from the bus drivers, he works with the kids to help resolve the problems quickly and really makes a difference. I've been trying to incorporate uh, the Jack Away program on the buses for a few years now. Daryl thought the idea was great and printed each of his each of us bus drivers at Fort Mags a stack of tickets to start using that same day. I've been very impressed with Mr. Edge and how he interacts with the kids and how he has really made a difference as a dean. I feel he is well deserving of this reward. Uh, I don't think there's anybody who is more deserving of the fall 2022 uh, award for the Shining Star, so Mr. Daryl Edge, so congratulations. And Mr. Edge, congratulations again. I, I too, kind of being over in that that neighborhood where that school is here. A lot of great things about you. So, you know, thank you much. Thank you very much for everything that you do. And what what great words to hear uh, from your colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations again, Mr. Edge. All right, next, uh, item 3.2, the Ohio Social Studies Secondary Teacher of the Year. Okay, thank you. So at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Cookson, um, Perrysburg High School principal, and uh, our very own Mr. Uh, Chris Stein, and we'll talk a little bit about his recognition as being named the, um, the U.S. History and American History Teacher of the Year. Good evening, everyone, uh, members of the board and, and public. Uh, thanks for coming out this evening. Um, I have the uh, distinct honor and pleasure to uh, speak on behalf of Mr. Chris Stein, who um, is a phenomenal uh, social studies teacher at Perrysburg, but also uh, just a phenomenal uh, person and someone who always goes above and beyond for uh, all staff and students at Perrysburg High School. Um, he is really a Mr. Do-It-All, not Know-It-All, uh, a, a Mr. <laughs> Do-It-All at Perrysburg High School. I mean, you see him at basically every single event, whether that's an athletic event, a performing arts event, visual arts event, um, before school, after school, he's just all over the place. He, he, I swear he has uh, a twin brother running around. So home and away events, he's just, he's just everywhere. Uh, well respected by staff and students alike. You know, every, every time I go into his classroom, it's, you know, it's, uh, it, he's a very good storyteller. Uh, he really engages the kids. Uh, he, he, he creates, you know, real life, applicable lessons uh, for them that are just so interesting and, and, and hit home. Um, the first time I went into Chris's uh, classroom last Last year, I got a big uh, uh, round of applause from his students. They all stood up and they, they applauded me when I walked in. I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. You know, this is the first time as administrator I ever have been applauded for anything. Um, and, uh, and his kids are just all on their feet and just clapping. I, well, and I figured out a couple weeks later, someone told me that they do that for everybody. Uh, he, he, he has them trained to do that. Whenever, when, it, when anyone comes in that uh, is not normally in that class, they all stand and applaud. But uh, seriously though, Chris, we appreciate you, uh, what you do at, at Perrysburg High School. He's involved in numerous um, uh, PHS um, groups, uh, committees, uh, as well as you know, coaching as well, basketball uh, and baseball. Uh, he just does a lot. His 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 hands are really in everything uh, at Perrysburg High School, and, and we couldn't thank you uh, enough, Chris. And you know, obviously the award that you uh, earned um, on October 15th at Capital University the Ohio Council for the Social Studies High School uh, Teacher of the Year, um, obviously is, is, is well-earned and you deserve uh, that recognition uh, as much or more than anyone I've ever met uh, as, a, as a teacher. So congratulations. Yep. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Ruffert's gonna join for the picture as well. Um, I'm, I, for those that are um, challenged with uh, vision, 
Um, actually, Dr. Joanna Weaver, who is associate professor for uh, the College of um, Education and Human Development at BGSU, uh, nominated Mr. Mr. Stein, and you can see here um, what he um, what he did. So, so not only is she an expert in in education and identifying best practices, helping other teachers become more effective. But she also was a parent, so you know when when she saw the nomination form, she she knew there was one person that was deserving. So it's quite an honor to to certainly be recognized by your peers and people in the district. But having somebody, you know, a professor at BGSU, be the one that raised their hand and said, "This is someone special," says a lot about you and the the passion that you have for your profession. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. What you do in the classroom, outside of the classroom, really well deserved. Congratulations, Mr. Stein. So at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Assistant Superintendent Brooke Price and Development Director Jeff Abke uh, for uh, recognition uh, for a donation that we received. Well, thank you. It's always uh, fun when I get a chance to get up here because it means we're highlighting a, a great partnership um, in our community. And uh, we've got a couple folks from Hollywood Casino here, um, Ben Human and Brad Hirsch. And then um, I know Bob um, Otter, who's from Citizen Aid, uh, was planning to be here but had a, a family emergency come up. So um, again, this is a great opportunity with teaming up with the, the casino and Citizen Aid and really providing um, a lot of things that are going to keep not just our students and our staff safe, but the community members as they come into, into our building. And Brooke, with the safety committee, I'll let her talk more about this. So I can hold that for you. <laughs> so Bob Otter is the CEO and founder for Citizen Aid, and he partnered with the casino, reached out to them, and they in turn then contacted us last year. The partnership started with them providing free access to online modules with trauma training. So truly the goal of Citizen Aid is to train one million teachers to save lives in the classroom if necessary. And so the casino was gracious enough to reach out to us and not only provide the modules, but now this year also to provide two wall units that have trauma access kits that are available for public use. Each wall unit contains about eight kits. So we're really grateful. If you guys wanna come up and just say a couple words, it's, it's your turn to come up. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much for giving us an opportunity, and it is a great partnership. Um, uh, Mr. Hostler, pleasure to meet you, and uh, board members, thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to speak. Um, I did want to make a note, like, Daryl, I, um, I was incredibly impressed when he's asked to speak. Firm head no, arms crossed. We were both taking notes of that move. We clearly weren't as strong to pull it off, but um, to, the, to, the, to the folks, Mr. Stein and Daryl, congratulations on your award. The work you do in our community and for our students is, inc is incredibly important. And safety and security is obviously incredibly important as it relates to our customers and for our employees at Hollywood Toledo. Um, Citizen Aid, which is based out of uh, Columbus, Mr. Otter, who kind of shared with us the vision for this program, which is helping lay people save lives, stop uncontrollable bleeding before paramedics can arrive so they can save more lives in the event of a, of a crisis. And I think, I think today is more important than ever that as, as members of the community, we, we kind of think about how to help each other and uh, be there for each other in, in crisis situations. So it is, um, we feel blessed and fortunate to have opportunities like this to work with, uh, um, obviously, uh, the Perrysburg, Perrysburg School District and other members of the community to ho hopefully help each other. And uh, Ben our, is our director of facilities, has done great work in kind of helping us get there too. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, again, on behalf of Perrysburg Schools and the school board, thank you very much for the contribution and for your support of the school system. Very much appreciated. Okay. So we're at the point where we uh, have a five minute break on the schedule. Does anybody feel like they need that break? Not seeing anybody going to the doors, so we will skip that for now. Uh, agenda item five is public participation on agenda items only. And I don't have a topic, and I don't believe this person is here, so we are going to move on. 
Uh, Mr. Husser, superintendent's report. Sure, thank you. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, this this month is um, uh, you know certainly a month that we focus on veterans and and their service and contribution to the United States and and all of our freedoms, and um, we wanted to take a little bit of time to to talk about the um, military connected families uh, and how the staff supports those. So um, I know we have a number of staff members that are here, so if they wouldn't mind coming up to to share their presentation. Uh, to go over the Purple Star Award, and uh... <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Best. All right. <laughs> Do you have the presentation or? I do not. So. Well. <laughs> oh, let me. Um, I, I, I can. Uh, okay, I see it. He'll just give me one second here. Um, it's probably not what you wanted to do. Uh, let me pull it up. Chad came prepared. We have a paper copy up here, so. <laughs> that should not take too long. You have to have certain rights. <laughs> um, <laughs> so let's go with that. All right, so, um, well thank you for letting us uh, share about the Purple Star Award. Um, this is actually the first year that Hall Prairie earned the award. Um, we had a small committee uh, that was led by Lisa Caswell. Um, usually, uh, well, every year that we've been open, we've had a Veterans Day dinner where it's been open to the community and uh, we encourage our students uh, and our staff to invite uh, family and friends who are currently enlisted or veterans in the community. Um, each year we also do an assembly where uh, our performing arts groups uh, come in. They perform uh, one song each, patriotic song. We also work very closely with the Perrysburg Exchange Club where we have a fifth grade patriotism essay contest and that's something that's carried over from when the fifth graders were down in the elementary schools. Uh, this year we were fortunate enough to have Bob Latta uh, come and be our keynote speaker and uh, he came in in between everything else he was doing campaigning and gave a wonderful speech. Uh, our school counselors also provide support for our students and our families. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Wernermont. Good evening, everybody. Uh, at the junior high each year, uh, we have a Veterans Day assembly and reception. It took place on November the 10th this year. Students were encouraged to invite a relative, a family friend, and or a neighbor to the, uh, to the reception and the assembly. We had approximately 25 to 30 veterans join us, and we were thrilled to be able to celebrate their service with us. Immediately after the assembly, the veterans were invited to stay and enjoy some refreshments in our media center with several students who were able to join us, including student council members, members of our web group, and students who have a military connection. And there are some of the pictures from our assembly. Uh, Mr. Wade Coons, one of our eighth grade social studies teacher, was our keynote speaker this year. We thought it'd be really awesome for the students to hear from an actual staff member who is a veteran, and we wanted him to be able to share his experiences. He really was able to highlight the, the opportunities that the Air Force afforded him and how they helped build his character and helped lead him on his career path to becoming a teacher. Uh, the top picture is of the students in the orchestra playing the national anthem. We absolutely love showcasing our student talents uh, throughout the program, and we had over 30 students playing the national anthem. We also had all six of our music staff members singing America the Beautiful and playing their various instruments. It was pretty fun to watch the music staff uh, in their element doing their thing, helping us to celebrate the veterans. And lastly, down there at the bottom is a picture of our uh, the reception after the assembly. 
where we have several veterans, their families, and the students enjoying some cookies, punch, and some cake while we celebrated, talked with them, and thanked them for their service. Thank you uh, for hosting us tonight, and go Bucks. Um, just, it's the beginning of the week, right? It's the beginning of the week. Um, my name's Rick Reddick. I'm the point of, contract, point of contact for all uh, military branches for Perrysburg High School. We just renewed uh, our Purple Star um, certification just this past year, so we're in the second cycle now. Uh, our veteran, Veterans Day celebration, we have a breakfast where we host our, our local veterans. They come in, uh, we feed them breakfast, and and one of the, the great parts of the um, our, our morning is uh, if you've ever been in our building in the morning, our, our commons is where students congregate. And so uh, at the end of that breakfast, we're able to honor those veterans uh, amongst about 400 of our students. And it's, it's wonderful to see how quiet they get and how they're engaged and interested in the story of our veterans. So uh, we started this process, uh, started our first breakfast last year. This was our second year in hosting. We have a special Special, and I think you might have seen on the screen a special table set aside for POWs and MIAs. Uh, as I was setting up, uh, there was actually the, the soccer banquet that was going on, and I realized uh, once I heard one of the overheard one of the soccer players said, "What does that mean, POWMIA?" And so sometimes I think that um, it, it goes by us as maybe uh, people who have been around for some time that some of our students might not know what that exactly means. So I think there's an education piece to these types of assemblies um, that uh, is not only for the veterans, but definitely it's the education piece that that we want to stress so we uh, we were actually able to educate our students on what that what that means and why we have a missing table and how, why we honor them so a special part of our, our veterans day breakfast and um, as far as the purple star is concerned in, in renewing the purple star and i don't know if you'll want to come back to the mic to talk about your purple star progress uh, there's quite a few things to do and there are quite a few things that we do in um, becoming a Purple Star School. Um, a lot of different opportunities. The month of April uh, celebrates the military family. Uh, we celebrate our military uh, children by highlighting um, maybe even all of the deployments and changes that our children have to go through who live in military families. And it's really enlightening. Um, I had some of uh, my students at the high school would say, wow, I'm really getting all of this attention. I don't know if I really want it. And, and, uh, and I said, well, it's actually deserved because uh, you go through some hardships as well when your your families deploy um, as the point of contact at the high school sometimes I might even serve a, a military family that's an elementary uh, school student um, uh, it came to me that uh, there was a family that was deployed they were a Coast Guard family and there was a um, uh, environmental cleanup that had to happen in, in the Gulf of Mexico and and uh, they were brand new to the district and you know they had this mom and a five-year-old and a three-year-old and now she's in those community that no one knew her and and what do we do and so we were able to aid her in getting activities and and things together for her children and so I think that's one of the things that Purple Star schools do for our military families they step up to the plate when our families need us the most or, or maybe if there's a family that's deploying with the 180th and we check in on those kids and make sure that everything's okay and what are your plans it's those those touch points that are really really special and important and I think that's what uh, makes us a, a very proud military uh, uh, school. Um, in addition, uh, we, I have the opportunity to go ahead and visit uh, quite a few bases, been to uh, West Point, um, down to uh, San Antonio at the uh, Air Force um, down there, um, our local guard bases, Rickenbacker um, Air Force Base, down in Columbus, I got to fly over the shoe in a Black Hawk. That was very cool. But but one of the, the greatest parts of that is getting our the opportunity for to bring that knowledge back and to educate our students at the high schools to some of those opportunities. Right now, we have three guardsmen who are at the high school, who are seniors in high school, and they're already in the National Guard. And if we didn't have the opportunity to get that type of education, um, they wouldn't have known about the opportunities to go in early to serve and start their six-year commitments with the Guard. So uh, a lot of really good things can come from being a Purple Star School. And uh, I'm very proud about uh, who we are as uh, a military-friendly school district. And I love the fact that it's growing throughout the, the rest of the, of the buildings. So um, a lot of positive things can come from this. So thank you.
I'll just share a couple more things from the junior high that's up there on this slide. Uh, so PJHS does hold monthly meetings with the students who have a military connection. Each year we send out a Schoology survey to ask anybody who might have a Schoology or might have a military connection. And we also look for the little emblems that are in our power school to help us identify our students who might want a little extra support, who might want to participate with us throughout the year. We also have student participation with our Veterans Day Assembly. We, as I mentioned, we have students who help us out musically. We have students who help us read several uh, different speeches that they've prepared and present in front of 800 and some students at the junior high, which is quite a feat for a junior high student. We also had student greeters. We had Boy Scouts help bring in the flag. And we also had student council members help us with the Pledge of Allegiance. We've also collected leftover Halloween candy and sent it to troops overseas, while also writing holiday cards for active military personnel. Uh, we're in the midst of writing those holiday cards right now. We had a tremendous response when we asked for people to send in holiday cards, and we've asked for students, if they have any downtime this week, uh, to work on those holiday cards so that we can get them in the mail so that they'll receive them uh, throughout the holiday season. We've also collaborated with the Ohio National Guard at the 180th Fighter Wing, especially for promotional videos. They were nice enough to work with us and put some special videos together uh, for some of our Veterans Day assemblies in the past. As Rick mentioned, we do love our Military Spirit Week in the spring. We have great student and staff participation in that, and it's great to see our students come together to support the students who might need a little extra support as they navigate some of those things that not everybody deals with on a daily basis. We also try to plan some after school social activities. We surveyed our students to see what types of things they might be interested in participating, and almost every one of them wanted to do something social after school so they could get to know other students who do have a military connection and also find that personal peer-to-peer -peer support. Uh, some ideas that we're looking to continue to implement and that we continue to talk about is doing monthly or bi-monthly gatherings, those after-school things, with the students. We're looking at creating an honorary wall to show appreciation for the military. We know the high school already has one, and I've talked to Rick about what went into creating that and some things that we should be aware of as we endeavor to do that. He had a great idea that perhaps we'd entertain the idea of doing a digital display that could be updated frequently and that we could continue to highlight more and more people as we get more information. So we're continuing to look into how we can make that a reality at the junior high using the TV that's right outside the main office. We're also working on developing a bank of resources for families, especially for new students who come to our building, things that we can hand them, things that we do here in the building, and local resources within our school, within our community, and within our local area that could be extra support for those families. We also had several students who were very interested in coordinating volunteer visitations with senior veterans at local retirement homes, sitting with them, talking with them, listening to them, hearing about their experiences, and just thanking them for their service. Uh, one last thing that we are continuing to work towards in January is having a military appreciation night at an upcoming girls basketball game. We're hoping to have a spirit night with our students where we have our typical spirit student section, but also have a second side so they can support each other back and forth, but then also also provide that extra support for our military men and women as they are celebrated and recognized during halftime of that game. So we're very excited to try that at the junior high level, and hopefully we have a very positive response. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Any, any questions? Or? No, that's incredible. Certainly appreciate you know, the support you give. You know, the, the, these are, this, is, this is one of the programs that highlights what a great district Perrysburg Schools is. And, and uh, identifying with the needs of each child according to what their needs are and, and what could be more important than our military children and families and the sacrifices that they, that they do in this day and age. So thank you very much for the presentation. Thanks. So I know, I, know we have, um, I know we have three of the um, Purple Star schools here and we appreciate the leadership that you've shown with that in, in getting that distinction here. It, it's, a, it's a lot of work and a lot of commitment. Um, and, and that is something that I know has set the bar very high for our other elementaries, um, you know, our, our elementary schools to follow that. Um, early in the slideshow, um, yeah, I wanted just to run through a couple things where we have, um, you know, scenes from just this past year. So up on the screen we have, of course, Fort Meigs Elementary um, with, uh, with certainly uh, Ruthie Reddick. Um, who was the performer and her dad, Steve, and, and also Stan George, who's one of our uh, music teachers. Um, at uh, Frank Elementary had, had standing room only, where there was a tremendous uh, breakfast and, and uh, uh, recognitions that took place there. 
And at, at Toth Elementary, um, we have um, Mrs. Colbuck um, with her father there, um, and um, just a, a great setting and, and a warm welcome for, for all. And of course, at, at Woodland, um, first graders had a special veteran visit their classroom. Uh, Mrs. Watson is a Woodland employee, and, and she talked about her 20 years experience um, with the Air Force, I believe. So uh, her duties, her jobs, she brought in her, her medals. And, and certainly uh, to have so many staff members through our district who have served or currently are serving, it's great to be able to pull somebody uh, like Ms. Watson out to, to highlight what, what she's done. And of course at Hall Prairie, um, just a, a, a great event and, and featured um, Congressman Latta. So, um, so um, just, a, just a, a wonderful time, but this isn't something that happens just during the month of November. It's something that is being talked about and thought about, like Mr. Reddick described. Um, uh, we always honor and, and recognize our, our servicemen and women who, who, um, who answer the call, but oftentimes their families are left behind and, and also are sacrificing and often new to the area. So thank you so much for taking care of those that, that have loved ones taking care of us. So, so thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And I apologize for not having that pulled up right away. So. <laughs> next on the agenda, uh, next item on the agenda is who are you and what do you do? So at this time, um, each month we feature uh, a group of employees that um, that that you know do work um, in the schools, and oftentimes people don't often recognize all the different kinds of roles that that individuals have here in the district. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to do is take a moment to, to, to connect with some outstanding educators and, and ask them, who are you and what do you do? So we have a, a, a first grade team here from, from Toth Elementary. So I'll ask them to come up and, and uh, introduce themselves. And, um, and I know they put together um, a, a kind of a, a unique presentation for us here. Oh. Hello everyone, um, thank you for allowing us to speak tonight. Um, my name is Haley Sundeball, I'm a first grade teacher at Toth. This is Jensen Mura, Jen Hooper, and Bill Lingle. Um, we were asked to come and speak about what we do and who we are, but instead of telling you, we would like to show you, maybe put some smiles on your face. Um, so we made a video about Toth. This is our amazing school. Welcome to Toth Elementary. Hi, welcome, come on in. So this is our beautiful mural that our amazing art teacher, Miss Arch, helped to design, the teachers helped to create. Kiddos can come to um, meet with friends, we can do small groups here, relax. This is a safe space in our school for everyone. This is a brand new playground. Hi, Toast Elementary Watchers. We just want to tell you how much we love Toast. I love Toast.
Hey there. We're going to walk into Mrs. Uh, Hooper's room. She's in the midst of a science of reading lesson. I just wanted you guys to take a quick peek at what that kind of a science of reading lesson looks like. So let's take a quick peek and see how she's doing in here. Okay, all right. Let's do this one. Let's do the word his. His, here we go. His. His. Is his. His. Okay. The first letter is an H. Do you hear it? Yes. Show me. Point to your ear. The second letter is an I. Do you hear it? Yes. Now, the third letter is an S. Does it sound like an S? No. No. It sounds like a what? A Z. So we need to know it by heart. Now let's spell it. Say the letters out loud as you write it. H I S his. H I S his. H I S his. Now show me. We have fun things to do. Recess, the centers. Recess and arts and crafts, math. My teacher. I like all my friends. My teacher. I like doing, playing with my friends. I like doing math. And I like, um, I like to have an elementary because of its teachers. Science and math. I love playing with my friends and I love my teacher. Favorite thing about Toad is recess. Mm -hmm. I like I like Toad because I like all the encores. That is fun. That Miss Boys We love learning at Toad and um, um, everything makes me more smarter. And my favorite teacher in the whole world is Miss Boys. My favorite thing about Toad is math. It teaches. Thank you for watching. We just want to put some smiles on your faces. Oh, well, and you did that, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank no. you right, for what thank you, you do. That's not an easy grade. That, that was awesome. It's our favorite grade. <laughs> I now know great. how to spell his. <laughs> One of my first involvements with the schools was teaching junior achievement. So I'd go in you know, five, six times over the course of a month for 45 minutes at a, a session. I'd be exhausted. So and a little bit scared, too. So kudos for you guys looking so calm and energized, because it's, it's not easy work that you do. It was a lot of, the so. video was a lot of fun to make. The kids were so excited about it. Thank you for that. <laughs> great. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. And I know their, their team is really just that. It kind of came across in the, in the uh, video, but talking to Ms. Molina, um, who is the principal at Toth, um, you know, just a, a great blend of, of, of talent that, that came together in that grade level. So it's really a, a special grade level, special building, but certainly indicative of what you can find in, in any one of our buildings. So we appreciate you doing such a great job and representing the, the uh, profession so well. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for having us. Okay. Very well done. Nice to see a video. <laughs> yeah, great. the classroom too, yeah. Yeah, uh, and I know they're all very busy, so I know many of you might have to go, so, so thank you. Um, so we'll move to uh, the superintendent's report. Um, so we, we um, uh, we talk about some different types of evaluations and ratings and things that have come out. Uh, Niches is, is a uh, service that, that um, pulls data from across the country and, um, and compiles it in a way, ranks it, and, and puts out the, their rankings. Um, and it, you know what they look at and, and how they measure different dis districts and components within those districts is always interesting. Um, don't know if we always agree with each one of those, but it is an, another outside kind of view of how they think schools across the country, specifically for Ohio, are, are doing. 
And, and so this is something that we often will, will, will just take a look and see. It doesn't drive our instruction, it doesn't drive what we do, but nevertheless it is something that is out there that people are looking at different uh, districts. So we, we looked at these, um, um, uh, their last uh, ratings that came out, and you can see here, again, under uh, 608, 607 school districts across the state, um, you have Perrysburg and three out of the four in the top 25. Um, and then 33rd uh, overall with uh, best places to teach. So obviously, uh, uh, you know, it, we've, we've taken a little bit of time this year to highlight areas where the district has, has done well based on different metrics. Um, and, and again, it's always great to see this consistency in terms of our performance. It's something that we haven't taken our eye off the ball in what we do and what we value. Um, so, so it's good to see that. Um, in a previous uh, update we shared, and Mr. Schwarzmiller talked about the state report card, it's a snapshot. It doesn't define who we are, but it certainly is a, an important snapshot that gives us a, a chance to reflect on how we are doing approaching um, you know, the state standards. Also, there's uh, many other components that go into it, such as graduation and attendance and, and other aspects. So we, we highlighted how we do against school districts in the area, but also he spent a great deal of time looking at comparing ourselves to our peers across the state, um, looking at those top districts um, in, in Ohio and seeing how we measure up if we're getting closer to those districts. And, and I think that is um, certainly an important conversation that we look beyond just the, the local districts. And certainly we, we have many high quality districts here locally, but we also want to take a look at across the state and use that as a measuring stick for us. This week we wanted to um, look at the state report card, our results with the performance index, which is kind of the comprehensive score, all the points of all those different tests and indicators kind of put together versus local charter schools. And you'll notice in, in Ohio, um, there are um, public schools, traditional public school districts like Perrysburg. And then there are, there, there are charter schools, which are publicly funded uh, public schools that operate outside of traditional schools. And you can see here um, with these are, these are actually districts where we have students that have left Perrysburg to attend those charter schools. So we um, put together a graph for the board to, to compare um, our performance index score at the top of 103.4 with the index scores from those uh, districts from across Northwest Ohio where we may have a, a student attending. So we, we enjoy the fact that in Ohio we have multiple ways that, that students can find a, a good fit for them and many of these um, charter schools do an outstanding job of, of servicing students. Um, but it is important to continue to measure how we're doing based on what the state holds out as a uh, performance. So Toledo School of the Arts uh, is, the, is, is uh, very well established in downtown Toledo. Um, they are next at 78.03 and the Northwest Ohio Classical Academy um, 76.49. So, uh, and then you can take a look at the others there. So again, it's that performance the state says this is what we're measuring your success um, on our state test towards the standards and some of those others and, and you can see um, you know, just the, you know, how well Perrysburg does uh, compared to um, some of the uh, charter schools in the area. So um, we know that we have some students that are going to those schools and, and um, doing very, very well. And, and we're thankful that those schools are there. So it's nothing to take away from their performance or what they do in meeting students' needs. But again, I think it's important to take a look at a snapshot in, in terms of, you know, how do we stack up versus those other alternatives. Um, this is something that um, was, was talked about and, and we appreciate the, the chart. I know that um, some, some folks uh, on the board uh, shared out, but um, this is the eighth grade math scores and, and it was an article that talked about the decline of eighth grade math scores and this was the um, chart that they used and if you'll notice there's one unusual a piece to this is that there's one district that actually saw an increase in scores where others fell, and, and that was Perrysburg. So again, the, what you saw with our teachers today, um, you know, working together, collaborating, certainly um, doing the, all that we can to focus on the individual student meeting their needs, 
um, it's something that remains a top priority for us and, and having great teachers that are there. Um, so we're excited to, again, just to highlight that, that appeared in the blade on October 4th. So. And oddly, yep. they didn't put what our score was on there, and it was 87.5. Right. Yeah, thanks. So, so that's, that's good news. And, and I know there's lots of challenges that are out there um, for all school districts, including Perrysburg. But, you know, coming out of COVID and, and the steps that we took to, to, to balance that, um, and then what we've done afterwards continues to be something that is, um, you know, demonstrating a return. So it's not just the district saying so, but it's also seen by, you know, the different levels of achievement that we're, we're seeing across the board. Um, one of the things, um, um, uh, Mr. Christie and I had an opportunity through the chamber uh, at their luncheon to, to hear our um, uh, Wood County um, Health Director speak and uh, grabbed a couple of his slides with his permission uh, about um, things that you've also heard about here in the district that, that are a challenge. And, and it talks, um, when we, we talk about the challenges that we face, certainly mental health has been a, a priority of ours as well. Uh, this is something that, that he shared out. Um, and, and, you know, ACEs, for those that may not know, ACEs is an adverse childhood experience. Um, and those are kind of traumatic events that may happen to uh, a, you know, a child under the age of 17 that could be experiencing violence, abuse, or, or neglect, uh, witnessing violence in the home or community, um, having a family member uh, die or, or attempt uh, with suicide. Um, and it also has to do with their environment. Um, when they talk about safety, stability, and bonding, um, and, and that undermines, uh, and those things that undermine that in the family unit. Um, so substance abuse, mental health, uh, instability due to separation or, or prison. So these ACEs are something that, that folks who work in mental health and the health department look at very closely. And this survey was done, and, and we talked about this survey and we had the folks come this summer and present our data. But again, I, when I saw it, it was something I thought that it'd be, I think, important for us to take a look at. But with students who did not have, so felt sad or hopeless two or more weeks in a row in the past 12 months, students that had uh, experienced three or more ACEs, those kinds of things that I just described, 69% felt that way in, in, the last, um, in the last year. Whereas students who did not feel that way, it's, it's 11%. So you can see here the difference between when, when students are facing those kinds of challenges at home how that is affecting um, some of these feelings uh, that, that you're seeing here with these behaviors. Uh, so that is 83% um, of youth smokers experience three or more ACEs, 53% youth drinkers, and 72% of youth marijuana users experience more than three ACEs. So it just has this ripple effect. So the work that we're doing in trying to provide that stability, build a bridge, between the schools and home and other mental health professionals is really trying to reduce these ACEs. Why, do we, why are we concerned about this? Is because the more um, that we can take care of eliminating these for our students, the more engaged they will be in the classroom and the more success they're going to experience in the classroom. Um, so that's always uh, what we do. Uh, another one of the slides of his presentation, um, 29% of Wood County youths felt uh, sad or hopeless almost every day for two weeks in a row. 23% um, they reported that they, do, uh, that they did not have anxiety, stress, uh, or depression. Um, we talked about this this summer when we presented this data, but 14% of the youth in Wood County uh, said they had seriously considered attempting suicide in the past year, five attempts, uh, zero success So with that, so we're thankful for that. 25% of the youth reported that sometimes they had no one to talk to. Um, so that's important. So as we begin to talk about the things that matter to us and what we do, um, you know, that, that social, uh, emotional connections that we need to make in the classroom, we know that students are struggling and we can do all that we can to make sure that they are, um, you know, feeling safe and secure while they're in the classroom. 
Um, this is something the junior high uh, students uh, raised uh, money for, um, uh, for the Children's Hospital at, at, with ProMedica. They raised over $2,500, so that spirit of giving um, continues to happen you know, throughout the district. So we're very uh, proud of, of what they were able to do and the, and the help that that will go towards um, you know, helping support children that have been hospitalized. Uh, we had the uh, season opener for the 2022-2023 um, high school theater productions with uh, Shakespeare in Love that took place. Uh, talking about the importance of, of mental health, uh, we just wanted to highlight that November 7th through uh, 11th was the National School Psychology Week. And um, we're very fortunate that um, we have some very dedicated school psychologists here that really help facilitate administrators and staff members and families navigate those. So we're very grateful for our, our team. And, um, and, and we have a, a very experienced and dedicated group of, of school psychologists here. And we're very grateful for the board to, to have been able to expand not only with psychologists, but social workers here in the last um, two years. And, and they work hand in hand. Um, with the election, um, just wanted to highlight that our district will have a new state board member. Um, outgoing Senator Teresa Fetter defeated uh, Sarah McGurvey um, and, um, and will be representing Northwest Ohio District 2. Uh, current state board member uh, Kirsten Hill from Avon, um, who was the incumbent, ran in a primary uh, for Ohio Senate, and that made her ineligible to run for her seat. Um, so we, um, a group of Northwest Ohio superintendents invited both um, candidates uh, to Springfield for um, uh, meet the candidate forum. So we had a great opportunity to hear from Senator Fetter and, um, and to look forward to um, the next uh, um, session. There was some additional news out of the Columbus Dispatch that talked about the state board uh, not long after the election. Um, there's been a bill that was introduced, Senate Bill uh, 178 from Senator Reinecke out of uh, Tiffin, Ohio. Um, the bill was introduced uh, some time ago, hasn't gotten a hearing, and it, and it was kind of a placeholder for kind of reconfiguring the state board. But shortly after the election, um, there is, uh, um, the bill has been refined, and they are now calling for um, to create a cabinet level uh, position that would be appointed by the governor. And um, that would be called the Department of Education and Workforce and the two divisions of primary and secondary and then Division of Career Technical Education. The State Board would then be stripped of all of its duties except those that it is constitutionally um, to, to cover, which is uh, teacher licensure, education misconduct, and territory transfers. And, um, and then the Superintendent of Public Instruction will still be appointed by the Board, but that will be the footprint of the Department. And then the governor's appointed um, um, cabinet level position would then be responsible for that. So um, Matt Huffman uh, from Lima, the president Senate, said that he expresses um, you know, support for this and, and frustration. So we're looking to see what happens with this during lame duck. So it is something that could move very quickly before the next session begins after the first of the year. Um, is there any way that, um, that we can stop that I mean, it, besides writing to Teresa or any other senator that we know, I mean, that it hasn't gone to the House yet. The House doesn't have a, right. a version of this, correct? Right, right. So it would be introduced in a committee, um, so, and then it would need to be voted out of committee. In that committee, um, sometimes they do allow public comment um, testimony. So that's always one place that we can, um, you know, let your opinion known about it, for or against. Once it's out of the committee, it then goes to the floor. If the president of the Senate says this is something we want to bring to a vote, then it will be voted on. Then it goes to the House, and that process starts all over again. So it hasn't even gone to committee yet. Not, not my understanding. So, so, um, but it, you know, talking to folks in Columbus, it seems like that could be something that could, you know, move, could move quickly. So, um, so not sure. This is the last. Um, um, until until um, December 31st, we have Speaker Cup, um, and then at that point in time, we'll have a new House Speaker, um, Representative Derek Marin out of uh, Northwest Ohio. 
So, um, and the Speaker and the President of the Senate um, will basically, they don't introduce bills, but what they do is they set the schedule for which bills are to come up. So obviously a very important position. So, so we can keep you posted on that, but things kind of move quickly here between now and, and the end of this, uh, you know, the, this session. Also in November, just wanted to give a, a snapshot. The Alliance for High Quality Education put together an in-depth summary, but we pulled some of the important things out of it. There were 120 um, school levies requested on the November ballot. Unofficial results indicated 86 were successful, 34 failed, so a passage rate of 71.7. Comparing this to general election um, the midterms, 121 of the 175 total levy requests back in 2018 were successful with a passage rate of 69.1. We're furthering breaking it down based on you know, levies for new money, bond issue construction, and renewals. Um, as you know, renewals pass at a, a typically higher rate, new dollars a little bit differently from renewals, and then bond issues are, are different. So we'll provide some additional analysis once the dust settles on that. Um, and Question. so, oh, sorry, yeah. um, the Alliance for High Quality Education, is that just strictly out of Ohio or is that? Yes, nationwide? we're members and, and um, so it, we're members. In fact, uh, Monday's lunch that we attended together at the, the conference was sponsored by the, 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 um, the Alliance. So, so they're the ones that analyze this. They're based out of Ohio. And there's approximately 70 school districts that are um, a, a part of the alliance, and we're one of those members. So, um, something fun, and, and we can kind of hold the comments to ourselves. But uh, the high school <laughs> entered the uh, Waterhouse World Toilet Day Art <laughs> Contest, and uh, and you can see our entry there. So some, uh, so we'll see how we do. We'll have to report back. So I think that's just for display only, but. Uh, <laughs> We can still vote on that, right? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So um, we had uh, eight students that participated in the BGSU Corral Honor Choir. So audition only, 150 total auditions, 60 ensemble um, uh, ensemble were included in that uh, choir, and we had eight students. So that's a tremendous accomplishment. It certainly bodes very well. Uh, this past weekend was the Junior High uh, Annie Junior Musical that kicked off their um, theater productions for this school year. And, um, you know, they did a, a terrific job. The, the um, OMEA Northwest Ohio Regional uh, Orchestra on uh, November 13th, 16 members of the high school orchestra performed uh, down at BGS or Bowling Green High School, I believe. And um, so it was audition and um, uh, with uh, Patrick Reynolds. The musicians performed, and um, certainly they had an excellent performance, outstanding experience. Mick Smith certainly were grateful for all that he does with his team uh, to to uh, promote that. So we're very proud of our um, very very proud of our our musicians. And then, of course, at the OSBA conference last week, we all had an opportunity to stop in. And our uh, select strings from the high school were featured, so they had to send a. Uh, um, a um, audition tape and recording so they were selected and and that's something that um, was great to see them in that environment so so proud of them also um, on november 10th uh, mr bennington and i had had the honor of attending the Penna career outstanding alumni we we had um, two chrissy christy armstrong and james henry who are perrysburg high school students um, Mr. Henry and, and, uh, and uh, Ms. Armstrong had an opportunity to, to talk about their experiences, very proud of being from Perrysburg, but certainly the experiences that they received um, at Penna were, were life-changing for them in both of their careers. So Christy Armstrong over, overcame, uh, talked about overcoming her disabilities and at one point being told, you know, this is not, you know, working with young children isn't something that you should consider. And not only did she consider it, but she is still working in that profession after all these years and, and has excelled. And uh, James Henry talked about um, in, in uh, working in, in um, his field of, of landscape and the connections that he had with his teachers and his classmates 
um, still getting together after all these years with his classmates and, and his, uh, his classroom teacher at Penna some 25 years later. Um, so, so that was certainly um, a, a, great, uh, a great event. Yeah, really so, inspirational messages, yep. stories by, by both of them. By all, by all six of them. Yes, yes. A little biased towards Perrysburg folks. <laughs> so in, in Erin McKnight, she's not one of our students, but her, her dad retired as one of our um, maintenance, uh, maintenance staff members. So, so we'll count her you know, with the Perrysburg connection yeah, there. So. I think so. Uh, transportation woes. I know um, things for us. Um, you know, we're we're continuing to use all the different drivers that we can. Uh, on days where we have drivers out, we we pull um, dispatchers, mechanics, um, anyone who who can drive. It still continues to be an issue, but I um, you know I know that parents have been very patient. Um, and and um, we've gotten some new drivers uh, here in the last um, six weeks, so certainly that is important and that helps. But just a snapshot, this caught my eye. Um, Reynoldsburg City Schools has been in a remote learning uh, rotation since the middle of October because of the shortage of transportation. Wow. Um, so, so the district is obligated to transport eligible students and cannot force parents to drive students to school. In their statement, we, if we cancel busing, we'll require students to present for in-person learning at school buildings. It creates an equity issue for students that don't have an adult to drive them, so it's an equity issue for students that don't have that ability to get to school. The other piece here is that under current law, um, when, when something like that happens, you face a fine for transportation. Um, if you're not providing transportation that once existed, they would they're receiving um, a sixteen thousand dollar per day fine for not meeting all of their uh, transportation responsibilities so if nothing went changed if you're looking at the rest of the year continuing with you know canceling routes um, which is what they've had to do i mean that's over a two million dollar deduction in, in state aid um, so so that has led them to do that um, columbus city schools also making mid-year adjustments to fix problems with busing and they're going to be releasing a new routes. They installed a new software program and um, has struggled with, with meeting that. So this is something that isn't just a, a Perrysburg issue. It's not something that is just a, a couple districts here and there. It is certainly widespread. Mm -hmm. And, and um, we've had to double up routes, which is, again, we're grateful for our parents and students to, to make sure that we still can provide transportation. We haven't had to cancel mm -hmm. and wipe out routes. Um, for students during the school day. But um, I know that when with all the activities that were happening at the end of the fall, um, things did get very hairy with trying to, to take kids and the success that our teams have extending their athletic seasons. Um, I think transportation is excited and then they take a deep breath because then they know they have to come up with all these um, ways to get kids to and from different events across the state. Finally, a teacher shortage. Um, uh, um, we had, uh, um, a BGSU College of Education had a summit in, no, in November, and uh, Mr. Christie came back, gave, gave kind of a, a sobering update of what he heard there and, and certainly drives what we do. But a couple things I just wanted to share that in, in 2019, so this is before the pandemic, um, they saw that there are one third fewer students enrolling in colleges of education in 2018 than in 2010. Um, Ohio posted a decline of nearly 50% um, between in, in that same time period, which is remarkable when you when you think about that. Um, so um, we also saw drops with um, uh, black and Hispanic prospective teachers, and and given the the um, and, and they wrote in their report that given the lack of diversity in the workforce, we know that we see a, an increase in diversity across the state with students. And that certainly is, is a concern of just getting enough teachers in the door. Um, in 2018, ACT, which is the, 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 the national test, used data from questionnaires to say, you know, what careers are you pursuing in the future? And from 2007 to 2017, it went from third among the top 10 and down to eighth. So a significant tumble, which fits what this other organization shared. Um, closer to home, in, um, and then just to give you perspective, there are 2000 and, and 2010 school year, we had 8,613 newly licensed teachers in the state of Ohio. Last year, um, 3,903. Wow. 
Um, so so it, it's, it's certainly alarming. ODE did share this with, with Mr. Christie, um, but this, if it, and, um, couldn't get a copy of the slide, so, so he snagged this picture, so I appreciate that. But um, it, total credentialed teachers is in the red, mm -hmm. and then in blue are those actually um, teaching. And then gray is, is working. So you can see that, that folks are, um, credentialed teachers are coming out of college, getting their license, but then how many of those are actually teaching? And you can see the, the difference here. And there was a lengthy dis discussion about the reasons what, you know, the reasons why. So um, certainly, you know, salary and wages is something that, that came through. Um, in addition is, is just, um, you know, that, that teachers are often targeted because of their skill set um, and, and what they're able to learn and what they, um, the skill set that they bring into industry. Um, they're often targeted by different professions uh, to, to join their ranks instead of teach. And with being offered more money, we're losing some there. And certainly students are watching and paying attention to what's playing out on social media and what's playing out across the country. And, and looking at that and saying, this is not something I want to do. Um, and also teachers who are in the classroom who are experiencing some of these kinds of things. Um, we're finding, you know, through, through anecdotal stories that they're not the ones encouraging younger students to become teachers because of their experiences, you know, in the profession in the last decade and certainly very, very closely here. So, so that contends to be very worrisome as we move forward. Um, on November 16th, we had our facility master planning joint uh, committees. Uh, the committees met jointly. Um, we're, we're inching closer to having a recommendation come from that committee uh, to address um, the classroom uh, shortage space that we have. And, um, and we're, we're still trending or targeting uh, January uh, to report back to the board or perhaps sometime in, in February. But um, very, a lot of progress here in this last, um, uh, this, this last meeting. So they worked very hard and um, we're meeting in December, so no time off. So. So that's all I have. Thank you. Any questions or comments on Mr. Hosser's report? Certainly a lot going on in the district. I had one, but I don't remember what it was. Well, it was that the, it was a sentence at the bottom of a slide, but it was like, <laughs> what, like I don't remember. <laughs> I'll go back through it again. If I see it, I'll, huh. I'll write to you. Want to also mention uh, a little bit of critical mass. I mean, a lot of good things going on Friday, last Friday. <laughs> you mentioned Annie Jr., and then there was, uh, we hosted one of the yeah. state football games. So, so a lot of coordination, a lot of effort over there at the junior high to make all of that happen. Yes. I don't know how they did it. And, <laughs> and Mr. Pullman, I know you were helpful in working through that, but yeah. thanks never, to the administration, the building leadership to do that. Game. Anybody know who won it? Yes, it was uh, it w it was not Elmwood. So we were we were rooting for them. Not that oh. that we we were we were a neutral site, but certainly yeah, Elmwood. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. we wish. Uh, um, so getting those sites is is quite a process with OHSAA um, because you have to have certain criteria of things available. So it's the first time that we've hosted a regional championship um, uh, football game, and um, and so. Um, uh, Mr. Jaco, our athletic director, uh, Mr. Henline, uh, worked very hard to get organized, but uh, we had the musical taking place at the same time. And um, I know Mr. Buecher did an excellent job in, in coordinating and um, student workers and volunteers, adult volunteers uh, that coordinated parking. And uh, we're very grateful that everything went well and our patrons could come in and, and uh, our theater goers and and we had over 500 pre-sale tickets just for the theater alone, in addition to hosting our regional championship football game here. So Mr. Uh, um, we pulled uh, Mr. Pullman out of uh, AD retirement and, and uh, there were some great uh, graphics and instructions that were put out. So very organized and, and everything went well, so except great. for Elmwood. So. Great, le great leadership and a nice example of the community kind of answering the call to help highlight what we do here in Perrysburg. Okay. I just answered one other question with respect to the decrease in teacher certificates. Um, and I know you'll hear a report from personnel committee and all the things that this district's trying to do to attract educators. Um, has anybody talked to the current t 
teachers who are telling the younger folks not to go in education. Is there a reason? I mean, you gave a couple reasons there. Um, is there something that we can pinpoint, or is it still up in the air, besides salaries and other, other jobs taking them away from education? I think... Um you know, I, I think there's going to be, I think there's been some studies that have been taking place, you know, to, to really dive into that nationwide and then here in Ohio. Um, we've had more teachers resign, as we've talked about, with all the new teachers we've hired, you know, early in their career, mid-year. Um, and I think it's just a, a combination. People go into education because they have this passion, and we've seen that on display today. And unfortunately, I think that, you know, um, that, uh, you know, being an environment even in Perrysburg where people continue to want to be here from other districts, that the, the, the challenges that are in place from different requirements from Columbus in terms of state testing and those kinds of things, I, I think the, um, you know, education has become the cause of and the cure to all of society's problems, and we've seen that. And, and I think it's become sometimes the political football that gets kind of, you know, punted back and forth between teams. Um, and I think teachers just want to, to teach. I think they just want an opportunity to do what they're passionate about and, and to go in their room and, and not worry about, um, you know, some of the things that, that they worry about. And that ranges from, you know, state requirements or a new bill that's introduced that we need to do it this way or that way or requirements that are forcing districts to take attendance a certain way or being worried about introducing a, a, um, you know, a topic in class and then going home and seeing it you know, uh, across social media. So I think folks are just becoming more and more weary of, of, of that, and, um, and that's sad. So, right. so I don't think there's one thing. I think it's a culmination of things all arriving at that same intersection. So. Um, Ray, to piggyback off that question, I read a great article, and if I can find it again, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, it had more to do with women, like um, younger women and what they were trying to decide what to do. And now so much more, you have more options. And so um, like STEM is really introduced at a young age. So as before, like my mom was a teacher, my sister is a teacher, that is one of the professions that you would do. But now the opportunity is very vast of what you know people want to go into. So. Um, this article was alluding to why people maybe aren't becoming teachers like they were in the past and where you saw a huge, you know, females. Again, this article was related to females, but that's what people, you know, would go into nurse, teacher, that kind of thing. But then now there's so many more options. And so that was talking about the trend getting out of teaching. Well, if anybody wants to talk to me, Mr. Hostler, about teaching, I'd be glad to talk to them about how much fun it is and being with kids and yeah sometimes you have to rise above the noise with respect to mm -hmm. some of the things that are going on politically I, I get that and in the last couple of years certainly has been interesting for all all schools in the country but sorry to hear that hopefully it gets rebounded and uh, I think I think one of the things is you know what can we control within the district and I think that's something that that I know with with Don's leadership Mr. Christie's leadership we've been really focusing on what can we control um, just uh, last week here in the cafeteria, we had all of our first year teachers back. Um, we got them pizza. We talked about how things are going and, and um, what it is that we can do better. What can we do to better onboard them to feel more welcomed? Um, in the past years, we take their picture, you know, at the opening day. And then 30 years later, when they retire, we'd check on them to make sure they were still there. But so, the, you know, trying to get those different touches throughout the year to make them feel connected. Um, at the high school, they started a, uh, a club. It's not the teaching professions class, but it is a club for individuals who might be interested in education. Um, Mr. Christie and I are gonna hijack um, a, a meeting that they're coming up this month. And again, food is a way to connect with teenagers and come into the classroom and, and uh, treat them to some pizza and talk about why, why we're so passionate about what we do and, and what a great and rewarding career it can be. Nothing, uh, not, not to take away from, from engineers or insurance salesmen or anything like that, but it is, it is a way that will, will forever, you know, make an impact on, on students and in, in their lives. And, you know, one of the things that we do with adults is to talk about um, a, a teacher that made a difference in their lives and get them talking about that 
and then asking them, you know, um, how important was that person to you growing up? And, and we need to, to have somebody who's willing to step in for that. And, and I think as a school district, focusing on that relationship between the teacher and the student, the more that we can focus on that and eliminate all that noise, as, as you said, Mr. Pullman, um, the better off we'll be in, in attracting teachers and, and having kids leave Perrysburg with an idea that this is a pretty special place and I, I, I want to find a place and, and give back that way. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a calling it, and, and folks that want to get in it for the wrong reasons, um, you know, we don't want them and that might not be a bad thing. Um, it's not for everybody. So folks that leave and pursue other careers, you know, that's, that's often a, a good thing in some cases but there are too many that are leaving that are certainly exceptional teachers. So. You know, and um, if I may jump in, I was actually, um, it's funny because I was looking for that picture that Mr. Christie shared with you because I was at that summit. I was actually the um, HR district person on the forum on the panel, you know, and this is one of my soapbox issues. You know, they're leaving because A, you get the same college degree as your friend who can make twice as much money, if not more in another profession with less hours less stress, less people in your business all the time. I mean, if you have friends who are in business, you know, they're not constantly having their issues put out on Facebook because they possibly read the wrong book or, you know, said something that, you know, somebody took the wrong way or, you know, they're not worrying about, you know, bills in the, you know, um, up for in the legislature, you know, they're going to be passed about curriculum, you know, and I had one of my, one of my friends asked me, and I've been in education for 28 years and that's all I wanted to do. And she asked me the other day, and these are girls I went to high school with, if you did it again today, would you still go into teaching? And I actually had stopped and was like, you know, I, with today's climate, no. Which is, it's a shame, because you have to show the positives. And you, so when I see these, um, these reports that you send, Tom, you know, this is what we have to share with our teachers coming into the profession. It's a solid profession. Um, it's a worthwhile profession. If it wasn't for teachers, there'd be no other professions. And we have to make sure that we that we put that out there. But you know, after 28 years, if you go, you know, not everything's rose-colored glasses. And I would, you know, if I had to do it again today, I probably wouldn't, which is unfortunate, unless the climate changes. You know, and it's and it's hard, yeah. exactly. You know, and when you your friends don't have to, you know, I mean, my friends aren't gonna, you know, have 26 family members, you know, constantly you know, questioning them if they're out the grocery store or going out to eat or, you know, it, and it's just a different constant barrage being questioned and you can't live that way. You can't. So I don't know how we do that. When we, you know, part of, part of BGSU, Project Impact Perrysburg is involved in that, you know, and that has helped um, with some of the conversations. You know, I know Mr. Swartzmiller is, you know, on that committee and we, we've talked about that, but you have to bring the good, but sometimes the ugly just, outshadow you know they're, they're it's just louder than the good and we have to keep telling the good stories but it's it's a hard profession and if we don't have teachers that's not something you can automate you can't automate it like you can at a you know self-checkout at target <laughs> yeah that's true i think that's, COVID that's showed my, that didn't it it's my that's my soapbox and i will i will <laughs> step will down off of that right soapbox. now and i have i have a lot more to say about that i did think of my question and this goes a little bit off topic tom you mentioned really that what was it 24 percent of wood county students said that they felt that they didn't have somebody to talk to mm -hmm. yet knowing the herculean efforts that our district has gone to to provide people to extend ourselves to create programs was the question then asked who would you want to talk to or who would you have talked to if they were there but you felt they weren't there to me that's the important follow-up question if it wasn't asked yeah. i don't think it was but let me check on that I'll okay to, that is a good uh, question so. i'll talk to ben yeah Okay, good discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hassler, for your reports. Next on the agenda is the Treasurer's Report. Mr. Drew, walk us through how we are doing. Okay, well, good evening. One of three things tonight. 
Last, uh, the last work session, um, Ms. Larimer asked about the 20 mil floor, so I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes kind of um, visualizing that for everyone. And it's important because it feeds into the five-year forecast. So this, these are all tied together. We'll show a brief snapshot of where we are today, and then I'll get to the five-year forecast. And just a reminder, we went through the five-year forecast in detail at the work session, so I'm only gonna hit a few key points that have changed since November 1st. So, um, and you've got the details in the, in, attached to the board agenda, and if you've got questions, obviously, we'll, we'll, we'll take them. Um, and you've got the same reports you've had, you know, for a number of months now, and uh, obviously there are 70 pages of reports, so I'm sure you re could read them at your, your leisure. So let me, let's talk about levees and the 20 mil floor. And, um, and this goes back to Sue's question. And this is a very important part of what is gonna drive our forecast and actually is driving the significant change in the forecast since, I, I, um, since May and since November 1st. First of all, this chart you've seen before, this is the blue is our residential valuations um, through 2021. And when we get 20, 2022 up there, you'll see a slight increase so that's showing our valuations, our, our property. And it's important, as we'll, we'll talk about, what's gonna happen in 2023, because that's, that's gonna drive the forecast significantly. And so when we talk about um, levies and taxation, you got two pieces, right? You got the valuation piece, and you got the actual millage. So this, this chart shows us our millage rates for just class one, that's residential and agriculture, which is the vast majority of our valuation. And you'll see some kind of the orange dropping, that's our operating levies, if you will. Then it takes a jump up, and that was for when you passed the, the levy in 2019, and it's kind of fluctuated, um, same level. That's important to note because the levies actually generate more money every year because of that 1.5 mil incremental. So it's generating more money, but the actual effective rate has stayed about the same. And we'll, we'll get to that here in a minute. So that's kind of setting the baseline. So I get a sheet from the county auditor, and this is part of that sheet. These are all of our levies, our two bond issues, our two permanent improvement levies, and then all our current expense levies and the, and the fixed income levies. And, um, and my pointer's, okay, it's kind of working. So. And all these are important. So this is, if you look in the, the full rate column, that's the, the full rate voted. So when, when, when these levies were put in front of the voters, that's what was, that was approved. Um, the, the exception of that is a, the 1976, in that year with, with um, legislation that combined all previous levies into that chunk. The other thing you'll notice on our fixed levies, they're not necessarily voted millage, they were, at the time, the voters approved an X amount. So then in, 19, in 2016, voters approved $13 million. So that levy always generates $13 million. And so that, the, the, the amount of millage on that's gonna change based on valuations. So that's the voted millage. And this is that same slide of uh, millage. The short bar is the effective millage. I'm gonna show you again. The tall bar is the voted. So you can see that there's this gap between what was voted for and what the effective millage is today. And, and it shows up here in this column, the, the, the effective millage. So over time, the effective millage has dropped, which is we expect due to House Bill 920, we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. And in fact, for example, the, the combination of those, the 2000, 1976 levies was what, 25.8 mils, is now collecting a little over 7.5 mils. So not all of these levies are sub subject to House Bill 920. The, um, the current expense levies you see at the top and the permanent improvement levy you see at the bottom are all subject to House Bill 920, which means when they were passed, you cannot collect any more than on those levies than the valuation at that time. You can add to it from new construction, but the existing valuation, you can't collect any more on it. So you can get a little bit more from new construction, but so that's why those, those rates drop. So like that permanent improvement levy 
At the bottom was 1.9 mils when it was first passed. It's down to less than 1.5. Generates about the same amount of money every, every year. So the 20 mil floor, where does that come in? If you look at this and go, hey, Randy, we're at almost 47 mils. That's way above 20 mils. And, and, you're, and you're right. But the 20 mil floor only consists of these current expense and general fund levies. The two fixed levies don't count toward the 20 mil floor because they're not millage levies, they're fixed income. So if you add up those numbers in the red boxes, that adds up to 20 mils. So does that, that mean that we can't go below 20 mils? We can't mils? go below. So we've seen drops in that effect to millage over the years. We've hit that 20 mil floor and we won't go lower, which is very significant when we get to the five year forecast. It because happened it, a couple of years ago. Well, we bou we've bounced around. We weren't quite there last year. No, I think it was like two years ago. Yeah. We didn't hit the 20 mil. But it changes, okay, based on valuations. We're there now, but you are right, Kelly. We are there. And, um, but in, it's, it's significant because depending on how much your valuation changes, we'll, we'll now see the impact of that. So that's, that's the 20 mil floor, so we talk about it. So between November 1st and today, I had a couple conversations with the county auditor, and because my assumption on valuations becomes very important because of this number, right? If it wasn't, because now valuation's going up, the millage cannot drop anymore for these particular levies. Now, the permanent improvement levy, it'll, effective millage will drop, but, but not for these. Okay, so that's a setup for conversation a little bit later. So where we are today. So we are one, th one third of the way through the year. Um, we'll talk about this revenue. Looks really strong. Um, if you look at the top two lines, real estate taxes and public utilities, personal property, slight increase on real estate and big increase in public utility. That's all because of effective rate calculations. There's been a shift a little bit on those revenue. We actually saw a decrease in one of our collections on one of our um, property tax revenue because the, the public utility is higher. So that's just that's more of a shift, but the, both of them are up. The big one is the income tax is up almost 17% um, year over year. So strong economic indicator in, in the district. And the la other one I want to point out is all other is up 46%, and that's primarily due to investments. So. Last year at this time, we were making about 1% of our investments. We were making close to 4%. You know, Fed interest rates, inflation driving that, and as long as you're not borrowing money, you're just investing like we are, that we're, that, that's a good thing. But obviously, if you're getting a home mortgage right now, it's not necessarily good. not good. So um, on the expense side, we're about 31%. So we're right, you know, slightly below, where, but, but that's right where we expect to be at this time of year. Everything is tracking pretty well. We have some concerns I've mentioned before. I'll talk about on the, um, and supplies, we're, we're there, but we're seeing some pressure, mainly diesel fuel and those kinds of things. This is our cash position. The blue line is this year. We're tracking our cash flow just like we normally, that, that normal trend. The nice thing is to see that gap between the yellow line and the blue line, so a little bit more cash this year at this time. But we're going towards our low point, right? When we get January and February, we'll hit our low cash position. Okay, so we're at 33% of the year. Revenue is strong, primarily income tax collection and investments. Happy there. Our expenditures, as I said, we continue to work on this. Um, diesel fuel, copy paper, all those things are up. Um, we, we're, we have some fixed pricing on some utilities, but some are not, so that's going to be up. And the other thing is, as Tom talked about staffing, is, you know, sub rates and things like that. That's a small amount, but those things all eke into that. And so just trying to control those, those costs. But overall, I think we're, you know, we're, we're strong right now, as long as we have no, no major upsets. Okay, so that takes us to the forecast. So the forecast, we've got the stuff I discussed on the, the levies, then we have where we are actual spending through one third of the year. So back in May, and there's, so, there's a lot of numbers in the forecast, so I'm just gonna keep us focused on two years. This year and next year, back in May, I had forecasted this year a negative 
um, a deficit of 344,000 and 2.4 million next year, okay? And then back on, as our work session, because of so, some improvements we've seen in um, primarily the revenue side, they turned that to a positive 130,000 this year and slight improvement next year, still a $2.1 million deficit. The big assumption I was making at this point was that next year is a reappraisal year, you know, six, sextennial, sextennial reappraisal. So in theory, all the properties in Wood County are looked at they're, they're, um, and they're reappraised. The state average in this past year in 2022 was 25 to 25% increases across the state. Um, I had 11% in my forecast. I talked to Matt down at the auditor's office and we went back and forth. He goes, and he goes, we're gonna be at the state average next year. And so I have revised my forecast to include a 20% increase in valuations based on reappraisal next year. And it's not the only component here. It really doesn't affect us this year but it affects us next year. So that reappraisal, in part, is gonna favorable of a million dollars next year towards our bottom line. So it's, it is really significant. So we're going up from 130 positive to 290 positive, and that is much of that increase, obviously, is still, again, investments. Um, all of a sudden, mine went blank. Investments, income tax, and the other thing, big news is our third biggest cost, salaries number one, retirement benefits, healthcare is number three. Our healthcare premiums are only gonna go up 3%. I had 9% in the forecast. So that, that is, that's big. Not only affects half the year, since they don't go into effect until January. The point is we're expecting you know 9% or so. Um, health insurance premium increases, we're only gonna go up, going up three. So we're looking really strong there, and there's a lot of there's a lot of good reasons for it. And Don and I've already talked about do a presentation to the board just on health insurance and how our self insurance works, because I think it, it it's um, it's an interesting interesting challenge. So that's that's where we look at it. We're looking better. Maybe if I keep revising, keep revising, I'll keep looking better and better. I don't know, but uh, we'll keep working on it. So what's driving the difference again? I've talked about that. And, and this year, income tax collections and investments are the two big things driving this year. Then FY24 and beyond are the valuations and the impact on the 20 mil floor. That's driving that. On the expense side, insurance premiums, and then the, the pressure on the increasing is things like copiers. Um, well, reduction in costs is copiers. We got a new copier deal trying to reduce those costs. Our propane pricing is really favorable, but then we have the flip side, diesel fuel, paper, and those things are pushing against it. Um, so that's, that's where we are on that. And a couple other items, I'll take questions. Our financial audit is ongoing. It should be done by the end of January, which is pretty cool because last year they hadn't started until end of January. So we'll be done this year before they even started last year. I talked about insurance premiums already. There's there's agenda item. Tom did a good explanation in the um, his board buzz on it. So there, I'm asking the board to to approve some fund to fund transfers that uh, it should have happened some time ago, but had not. And that's what that that I think it's item 7.3 in there. And and now the next big project is we're looking at some longer term projections with the work the facilities committee has done preparing that recommendation for the board. There's a financial component on it that we're looking at the five year, not five year forecast, but looking at 10 and 15 years out. Obviously it's gonna get murky and murkier, but we've gotta look, try to line that fork, that, that those long-term projections up with the building project, right? Cause there's a lot of, so that's coming next. We're working on that based on some of the assumptions that the facilities group have done. So we have what their thinking is, we're refining that for you. And as soon as that's ready, we'll be make that recommendation. Then we'll also be able to look at some financial stuff that go with it. So, there we go. That's the, the speed version. What questions do you have? Um, I have a question. Um, I like the presentation from the work session, the detail and how okay. you laid that out. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, my question is, and you don't present it 
here at the board meeting, but it's on board docs. The, um, the, the, the five-year forecast, when you compare it to the, the October financials, there's, it's, it's off, and I don't understand how you, how you have the one number and how you can have the actual, you know, we have three months actual, to then the um, five-year forecast and, and how it can be so off. Do you know I'm, I'm not sure what you're, what you're asking. Um, so, so, so if you look at, I'm gonna go back, I think you're going back, let me go back here. So the forecast in that first column is based on the May forecast. It's based on what? It's, it's May's, it was, it was the numbers that were in May. So after you approve the five-year forecast, I will, adopt, I will adjust this first column to make, because this is what I'll submit to the state. Right, right. So, so, that, so this, these numbers on, that, my, my pointer's not working yet. The, the first, oh, okay. The, so that's based see. on the numbers I did in May, which projected a $340,000 deficit. So when I redo, once we approve the forecast, I'll adjust that column to match what we're going up against. Okay, because so, you have us, you have us, um, in the one forecast, you have 1.192 for the October financials. Um, it's not on this one, it's on the one, it's on board docs, but you don't. Oh, oh, it's, it's the cash flow analysis. Okay. Yeah, it's the cash flow analysis, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and that, and that, again, that'll have, they'll get revised. They all feed each other, right? Right, that's why, so there's a big difference. And so if one feeds the other and you haven't the five, five year forecast, then 290. So, so once that's I a get- a million dollar difference. And I'm trying to figure out why one says this, but the five year forecast is what you're using to lay it out. How yeah, can that be such a what's difference? What's gonna happen is once the five year forecast is approved, it'll feed that other document. Oh, okay. So they're tied together. So. The five-year forecast sets those comparison up. That five-year forecast right now essentially is a draft until, until the board approves it. Okay. And then when I upload it to the state and then tell my software, this is the new forecast, it'll, do, it'll change those comparisons. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it gets confusing because it's, it's apples and oranges in your point in time. The four, and the other thing is there's, what you don't see is a reconciliation of the forecast to the budget because that's even a, a, a completely they don't those two don't even talk to each other unless I force them to talk to each other okay then I had one more thing that I noticed um, the five-year annual increase in expense you have 4.76 percent but you forecasted 8.53 and, and why why was that and, and a different what, what, what document are you talking about so well it was on slide 13 of that the one you didn't present, but the one that's on board docs. Um, here, I can pull it up on my phone. 13, let me get to it. Again, this, this is, oh, it's the five-year forecast document. So this is the narrative that goes with the forecast. Or the the narrative, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I was, I was, I was reading, yeah, the narrative part, yeah. On page 13, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine point. Right, I'm just saying that the expenditure change expected year over year to be 9.3%. Well, no, it says total expenditures increase 4.76%, and then you're, but you're projecting 8.53. And I'm wondering why it has been 4.75, but you're, but you, but you are projecting it to be 8.5. Okay, okay. No problem. Because you know there's been there's some there's been some adjustments like diesel fuel and things like that, but this is where this report here should be is update based on all the new inputs. So okay. the, the 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 costs and because um, I'm not seeing those numbers here, so I apologize for not having that. Okay. Too much paper. <laughs> Any other questions? 
Oh, I have one. I had one about the, um, wait, what's it called? The, the, when, when was this, um, hold on, I gotta get the exact name because I wanna say Perrysburg School Funding. Perrysburg Educational Foundation Trust. When was that established? How many years ago, Tom? Um, probably 10 years ago. Okay. I was going to say, I thought that's what you had in the buzz, was that it was at least 10 years ago. Yeah, I don't know the exact date off the top of my head, but it's been, it's been a while. So it, it does a lot of things that you, we can't do, the foundation couldn't do when they establish it. For example, if, if um, Kelly Eubank wants to establish a, um, like a, a, a chair to fund a position, the foundation couldn't pay salaries out of that, but we could out of something like that. So there are donations that came into that fund that were just supposed to distribute it out yeah. and um, they're earmarked. This was a mechanism for us to do that. The foundation does most of that today, but there were some donations that were in there that um, hadn't been, they'd been allocated, but they hadn't been actually been distributed. Right. In right. some cases we'd actually spent the money, but we, we never, we never reimbursed the district for it. There's different rules that apply for investing public funds. And so when Randy talks about investments with the general fund, there's only a few um, investment vehicles that he can use. Um, when you think about the, uh, you know, different foundations that are out in the community that handle investments for, um, you know, nonprofits, school districts can't interact with them, do anything with them. Mm -hmm. And going back years, um, there were different scholarships that were donated to the schools in the 1950s and the 1970s. Those, those sat you know, in, in the general fund under a certain line item, but they collected very little interest. So creating a, this, this fund allowed us to collect those funds into one account and then that account by the nature of it being established allows a little bit more flexibility within the state guidelines that go beyond the general fund. So it also creates a, a little bit better um, investment opportunity. Mm -hmm. So it's not to compete with the, the Perry's World Schools Foundation, which is its own entity. Right. We don't control that, but these are for to sweep up some of those funds that we have on the books. And then any new funds that come directly into the district, we can put them into that account, which we can handle a little differently than just the general fund. Are there minutes from that meeting? I was just curious. We didn't it was get at like... a board meeting, so yes, the the school board approved the creation of that. No, I'm asking like from the meeting that you recently had. It's attached. To, it's attached in the board docs. Yeah. Oh, it was on this. Yes. Oh, I can't. I don't see it. I yep. Look for it. Oh, to answer, um, Kelly, ask your question. Okay. That 4.76 is the previous five-year average of increase. The 8.53 is the forecast for the next five-year increase. Okay. So that's it's just the ex the exponential growth, the compounding is what it is. As, so that's the 4.76 last is the previous five years. 8.53 the next five years. I know, but why the increase when we when we've well, seen because enrollment go up for ten years, about a hundred students. Yeah, but it's, you've got a compounding impact wave. So if if I ha if I'm at a million dollars today, and I have three percent a year, that's going to grow. So each year that three percent has a bigger and bigger impact. So it's it's it's, it's a com it's a compounding factor. And we can do the the math. So as our salaries have gone up, right, our biggest cost component, that same two percent is even though it's a 2% of that, it's bigger than the previous year. So it's just, it's compounding, is what it is. It's just like um, um, interest on your interest, right? You invest early and you make more money over time. It's the same thing here. And that's why it's, it's, it's scary that if any time, when you, when, you, when you talk about things like, when you're in negotiations, a base increase on any of the staff, well, that 2% this year, three years from now is bigger than 2% because of, of the compounding factor. That's what's okay. happening. And so, so that uh, has to do with like the younger teachers and the older teachers and how their increases go. Yeah, exactly. Like that. Okay, that's you know, right. That's that 2% right on $80,000 is different than 2% on 40000 Okay. That's what it is. And then, again, that, that's a good, good catch. Okay. Anything else? Well, like you said, the salaries are the biggest increase, reason for the increase, the salaries. Well, yeah, and even if you hold salary increases like we have, you know, our, uh, the, our salary increases on the base are less than averages in, across the state. But because of the size of it, 
you know, of where our overall salaries are, it, it just has a, it just has a larger impact. You increase the number of on the staff, yeah, then that, increase the salaries of the current staff. Yeah. So it's just yeah, it, it's, it's a good projection. It's a scary it's a scary um, curve, right? Because we have Hard to, to withstand that. Yeah, yeah, it's you're looking at that curve and going how are we gonna, how are you gonna, how are we gonna fund it? But we remember 84 percent of our budget is going to be personnel, so we expect that right so yeah and then things like um you know retirement it follows exactly with salaries right because it's a percentage of it's 14 or 10 percent of depending on what 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 staff you belong to and then on top of that then the fastest growing portion is health insurance benefits and um you know we've done a good job of controlling it but uh like i think wood county consortium was a 20 percent increase on their health insurance benefits and Northern Buckeye Consortium was 15%. So our 3% looks really nice, and that's a, a testament to the wellness program and the staff and stuff. So we're going to keep working The other that. thing, too, Randy, you know, is that the retirement changes has also impacted how long teachers stay at the top of the scale. When you go back five years, it was 30 and out. Yeah. Now there are some varying factors, which you have teachers that are now staying 31, 32, up, you know, up to 35 years, depending on their age in some cases. So that also has kept more teachers on the payroll, in, where in previous, you know, looking at the comparison before, they were out sooner. So that's also increased, had an impact on some costs. And, and you have things, and that's an impact on insurance costs too. You know, you got how many people do you have who are delaying retirement just because the insurance side, of how expensive health insurance is and good coverage. And then, then right now, you know, the state teachers retirement, they're talking about trying to increase the employer share to 15%. And our certified salaries are our biggest salary component. So add another 1% on that. So it's all those drivers that, um, that, that we have. And it's just, it, it's, a, it's a reality of, of what we have, so. Yeah, and the variance, 3.7% is not bad for a $78, $78 million budget Two million dollar variant variance. That's pretty good projection. But I mean, I think, but I think, I think Kelly's point may be, and it's right. It's it's a scary. It's because it's it's not linear. It's going to keep keep growing, and we got to we got we got to take a. I don't know what we can do. We need to, we need the staff because that's who teaches the students, and then you know where do you how do you put the you you, you really you gotta, how do you put the brakes on something like that. Growth in, in the five growth, year growth, growth is better only yes. <laughs> looking out five years is really a crystal ball because you're looking at two different biennium budgets with the state, and you're really you know trying to to look at what that could hold in the future. Randy went back to 2017 just for giggles and shared it with me, but in 2017, five years ago in the five year forecast, we were projected to be at a, uh, a two million dollar deficit with no cash this year yeah and here we sit with where we are so so you know next year is obviously the crystal ball is much more clear the following year a little more clear but when you start getting out to those years it's it's a challenge because if if we you know we always look forward but sometimes it's interesting to stop and look back to see where we would have been based on our previous five-year forecast and and you know we're and not that, there thankfully you know, so and it's important thanks for the conversation because that's what this is all about I mean we all have to own this, right? It's my name on the report, but it's really the Perrysburg Exempted Village School District five-year forecast, and ODE and and um, Auditor State rely on these documents for how they they view us. So, yep, you got a lot of lot of information, a lot of good stuff. Yes, of course. Information. I appreciate how you present it, too, Mr. Drew. Okay, with that, we're looking forward to owning it, so we're ready to. Accept a motion. Let me get my bearings here. Sort of agenda item 7.5. I'm looking for a motion to approve the Treasury Report item 7.2 to 7.4. So moved. Second. Slammer. Mr. Pullman. And roll call, please. Ms. Larimer. Yes. Mr. Pullman. Yes. Dr. Reffert. Yes. Mrs. Eubank. Yes. Mr. Beddington. Yes. With that, I'm going to ask for a 10-minute break. Is that all right? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. We'll be in a recess till 7.30. Thank you. Yeah. Tom, Tom, will you open that Perrysburg Education?
It's so quiet. Yeah. It's so dark outside, too. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and get back into session here. Next agenda item are committee reports. We'll go down the list and we'll start with personnel committee. Uh, doesn't have a date here. It was one head uh, this afternoon, right, Lori? You want to go? Yeah, we did meet this afternoon. Of course, the conversation was finding people to drive buses, monitor the playgrounds, and paraprofessionals, and substitute teachers. All the above was talked about, and um, the, the, the uh, Don and his crew is doing. They're doing a good job of uh, finding ways, creative ways, to attract workers to our district. Um, and you'll see some dates down there, February 8th, uh, there's a teacher's uh, job fair here in the district that they'll encourage all to attend. And then uh, job fair in Bowling Green, March 30th and 31st. But um, Dr. Refford, you might wanna speak to the uh, working with the I QR code and how they're game planning that. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, uh, we're trying to be proactive in the district recruiting and um, Mr. Christie is working with um, communications to come up with a recruiting um, flyer and using a QR code, which will take us to the website. Um, so uh, it'll be on all of the publications. Uh, just some, you know, trying to find different ways to get people to go to the website to apply for positions, um, you know, because they're constantly hiring for the positions Mr. Pullman just said, we are down paraprofessionals, down a bus monitor, crossing guard, um, playground monitor, and um, substitute teachers as we head into, while we're, he's interviewing, and have more about what, heading into, you know, the winter. Um, so hopefully we will be able to fill some of those so we won't have unfilled positions in the building. So just he's trying to try a few different things. Um, you know that we, we have some tools in our toolbox that we're gonna try to use. Um, for personnel so how many um, crossing guard positions I, I thought we had hired those and then we're down to four so one we have one that we're still trying to fill where is that one Brooke Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, going down the finance committee, I think we've we've uh, heard pretty much what was discussed. Mr. Pullman, anything to add? No, I think that's All right. a good report. Curriculum committee on uh, November first. Dr. Well, Rufford. Well, thank you for stopping in, Mr. Bennington. Um, so uh, we had uh, teaching and learning on the first. Uh, talked a lot um, about, um, I think the big highlight was the addition of AP Calculus BC um, and just some of the data. I pulled out the notes or the agenda Mr. Schwartzmiller had. Um, last year, there were 61 students who took the um, AP Calculus AB test. The mean score for students was a 4.5, 7 out of 5, and Perrysburg had 41 students score a 5. Um, which was 67% of their class scored a five, which is pretty much, you know, they can get college credit depending on where, where they go. The national percentage of students who receive a five is 22%. So Perrysburg students had 67% score a five, which is fantastic. Um, so they're adding a, they actually had students reach out, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Schwartzmiller, but they had students reach out saying, hey, what can we take next? because the next level class, these kids are taking it as a junior, the next level class would be a college class. So we're able to be um, starting to offer that in the high school as the AP Calculus BC class. Well, see, it starts with those toe first graders that like math <laughs> so right. much, and it goes into Brent's vertical curriculum planning that he started years ago. Well done. <laughs> right, because, yeah, so um, I just think that was, you know, other than the AP stats, it's just, you know, going back to, I know when my soon-to-be 24-year-old son started taking the high school class, 
as a seventh grader, and by the time he got up to, there wasn't anything really left for him to take except for AP stats, which he was not really interested in. <laughs> so, right, so he had taken all the AP and all the honors classes, so this is a, just another tool for our students to, you know, have our teachers teach them and, and you know, preparing them for whatever future career they have. So that, I thought that was the highlight. Lots of other things going on, but that's the one thing I wanted to highlight from the, from the meeting. That's impressive. I appreciated you guys letting me kind of crash that meeting. And I think my highlight was, and I forget how competitive Mr. Schwartzmiller is. So <laughs> he's got the board of where we rank against other schools, and it's like being in a sport book or something. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, and there was a lot to that meeting, not that you say that, you know, I, he, super competitive, which is awesome for our curriculum, but just talking about, you know, looking at the students and the student groups and how we can be, um, we can assist those students that aren't our highest performers and what other school districts are doing to, you know, um, to bridge that gap. So that was a part of that too. Better said. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anything on the foundation, Ms. Larimer? Uh, yeah, there was a meeting on the first and Probably one of the the big things that's going on is that you know it's it's coming up close to Giving Tuesday, and that is a huge fundraising drive for the foundation that is used to, uh, as you as you saw the grants and such that they provide for um, classrooms and students and programs throughout the district. Um, if you saw it in the paper or saw any other emails that were out, the big the big push that the new car wash, um, was it, is it clean car wash, car wash express? I, oh golly, Don't that's that bad, wrong. I've forgotten the name of it. It's clean. right there on 20 behind clean, Starbucks yeah. clean and T-Mobile. I can tell you where it's at. Um, Ray, you were there, do you clean. remember? Clean, clean Express. Clean Express, oh, well I had it and just didn't put it in the right order. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next meeting to see if we have what was actually raised. I know I bought a gazillion gift cards. <laughs> and I mean, the gift cards were amazing. They were $50 value. You only paid $25 for them. And all of that money went to the Perrysburg School Foundation, plus any donations that anybody gave as they went through and got their free car wash. That all went to the Perrysburg School Foundation, and that, that was just an amazing thing for them to do. And I got a really, really nice car wash several times, so. Um, but that'll, that'll be the next really big thing that's, that's going on there. So you might be getting a letter from the, well, I think there's been, I think, I think there've been some letters or emails come out about Giving Tuesday that went district-wide, so that's what that's about. Okay, thank you. Um, lastly, Penta. Uh, Mr. Hossler covered the um, alumni, uh, the Outstanding Alumni Award very well. We also discussed and approved the five-year forecast uh, uh, over there. And then coming up on December 1st, Thursday, December 1st, is their annual scholarship dinner. Which again, just a little plug, really nice event. It's kind of a culinary experience where the uh, culinary department over there will make different uh, different types of meals, uh, appetizers, When's that? proteins, December 1st, Thursday, uh, in the evening, about 5.30, I believe. So if you want any more information on that, please let me know. I'll be happy to attend with you. Um, okay, any other committees? I know we're a little light on committee work this month. Um, the only thing that I really wanted to highlight, and, and Tom really did a good job of it, is that... Um, Senate Bill 178 that's going through. I did kind of, I did a little bit of research on that um, because it was kind of a buzz down at the um, conference. And there's a group of people that say it's unconstitutional. And honestly, I think yes and no. Um, it would be interesting to hear what an Ohio Constitution attorney would say about that um, because the Constitution says there shall be a state board of education which shall be selected in such manner and for such terms as shall be provided by law. Okay, so this was taking, this was back in 1953 and it was taking the control of Ohio education out of the governor's office. 
because the people of Ohio did not want it in the governor's office. So this amendment to the Constitution took it out of the governor's office, but it then says, as provided by law. Well, who's doing the law? The current legislature. So it continues to say, there shall be a superintendent of public instruction, they changed the name, who shall be appointed by the State Board of Education. Well, SB 178 isn't changing that, just making it almost more of a useless position than it already is. The respective powers and duties of the board and of the superintendent, guess what? shall be prescribed by law. So I'm wondering, Tom, if this really isn't terrible. I mean, I can see where it would be and where it isn't because it's putting it back in the hands of the governor's office by making it that kind of a position, but it's being prescribed by law. I, I don't think they can put it back in the hands of the governor's office and take away all the things from the state board because that's what the people wanted. They didn't want it. And if, they're, if the goal is to keep it from being a political entity, this bill that they're trying to pass certainly does not do that. It makes it more of a political entity because the state board of education is already a political entity with the stupid eight appointments on there. So this was something that I screamed to the hilltops and, um, when I ran for second district. And, and for the, the article in the blade, for them to come out and kind of call out the Democrats and to call out Teresa Fetter, who made it very strong that we need a state superintendent of public instruction, that didn't seem to jive. The blade is supporting this amendment. And, or this legislation, which makes no sense to me. We want to get the politicalness out of education. This bill is not the way to do this. So I would strongly urge the board and, and anybody who wants to, to be writing some emphatic letters to Teresa Gavarone, to Haraz Gimbari, and say, this is nuts. This is absolutely nuts. And, because it wasn't in the legislative platform, I'm not really sure what OSBA is lobbying on, but I think I do remember that they are lobbying against this um, because I think that was already in something earlier. So I think that they are going to be lobbying against this, which is, is a good thing to do. But keep your eyes on that. Please write to them and tell them. I think we need to get a lot of the school boards in here. And it's not to keep the power in school boards. It's to keep the politics out of schools. And, and we've just mentioned that. How many times have we mentioned that tonight? That that's one of the main reasons that teachers don't want to come and teach, because they're sick of the politics in schools. This bill is going to make that worse. What house bill is it? Um, 178. 178. So Lori's had a soapbox. I've had a soapbox. Who's who's next? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ms. Larimer. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda covering items 10 through 14.2. Can I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. Dr. Second. Rufford, Ms. Larimer. And roll call, please. I'm sorry, discussion? <laughs> okay. Roll call, please. That's right. Dr. Reffert? Yes. Ms. Larimer? Yes. Mr. Pullman? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? Yes. Mr. Bennington? Yes. Consent agenda passes. Okay, we're up to uh, item 15.1, board discussion on new business items. I have one item that, uh, and this is just, uh, say, an opening conversation. I don't know that we need to make a decision tonight on it, but uh, as we've said at our last work session, surprisingly, we're getting towards the end of the year here, so it's time to start looking towards next year. 
one of the first things that we're going to have to do, or one of the last things we have to do this year, is decide on the date of our organizational meeting for uh, January. That meeting needs to be held within, 50, is it 15 days? Yes. Of the start of the year. And just for consideration, last year we did that meeting January 10th, which was a Tuesday, uh, in the evening at 5.30, and we did not have a work session. So what I'd like to do, so check your calendars, and we will plan on discussing that at either our next work session or the regular board meeting. So you're suggesting the 10th? I'm suggesting the 10th, but, I'm, well, I'm suggesting that last year it was on the 11th. This year that Tuesday falls on the 10th. <laughs> okay. Well, as I, um, as I mentioned, the, the only conflict that I personally have is that there's a foundation meeting on that Tuesday. Um, but I can work around that. Okay. If, that's, if it's not a problem for anybody else, I'll work around it. What, right. what time are you proposing? 5.30 is what we did okay. last year. So pencil it in for now? Until we work session? Up. I know. Yeah, what put on no, that's are you gonna, um, Mr. President, um, so you got three meetings to do in January, tax budget hearing, organizational meeting. Are you going to do th those and then do the regular meeting later? Yes, that's, that, okay. that's what I'm envisioning. Okay. You know, we can do a work session if we feel a need for it too, but those would be you know, the work session, the tax, or the organizational meeting and the tax meeting kind of in the same yeah. evening and then a regular board meeting later on. Okay. So the January 3rd would be omitted? January 3rd? No, no meetings. That's no. that's the work session. That's what I, I mean. That's consistent with what we did last year. So the tenth would be everything. Correct. Let's talk about scheduling a regular meeting though later in the. Oh, month. regular meeting in the third week of January. Okay. Yes. So you got. All right. Well, good. So Take no, a look at, nothing on the third, but one on the tenth, and then the sixteenth would be our regular meeting. It'd be the 17th because we'll the, the 16th is a meeting, correct? That's true too. Yeah, we got to discuss that. So we'll pencil in the organizational meeting, and then we'll discuss the other committee meetings and our meeting agenda during the organizational meeting. That's right. Well, the reason I think Ray's asking is because the third comes before the tenth, and that would normally be a work session meeting. So are we? We're, yes, we're, we're officially skipping that one for. Right well, we have to have January. This always happens, and what we usually do is piggyback when we do have to have a, a work session. You have to have an organizational meeting first, yeah. because it starts the new year for the board. So, right. so at that point, you don't have a board president. You have a what is it? A pro, pro, pro tem. Yeah. Oh, pro tem. Yeah. You, you elect one in December. And then, so you have to take care of all those things before you can do any business. So, so that the, you know, the cart before the horse kind of a thing. So the organizational <laughs> meeting has to happen first. Okay. So, so. In January 3rd, typically we don't have meetings when there's no school. So school's not in session then. So the 16th, we wouldn't have the meeting. Typically it would be the Tuesday, the 17th is what we've done in the past. Because of the because, because of Martin of, Luther King Day. Yeah, correct. Martin Luther King Day. Yeah. No school on Thursday or what? The third. No, oh, it's Tuesday. The okay. third. Well, let's plan on solidifying it at a December meeting. Okay. School doesn't start that week until Thursday. Any other board discussion? Okay. With that, we are at uh, agenda item 16.1. We have one speaker signed up, Miss Laura Menke. And uh, your address was not written down, so if you'd state your address. Sure. Uh, three minutes. 950 Lober Drive, Perrysburg. I would like to address with the high school the 21 hours throughout the year of two-hour delays, or not two-hour delays, but early dismissal, along with we can also talk about the two-hour delays that go on. Every Wednesday, pretty much, there is an early dismissal of an hour. We promote our school as being the best in Northwest Ohio. We really need to move on making better decisions with our time and use of everyone's time. Actually, I'm really surprised. Most teenagers, you would think, would be fine with getting out an hour early. 
and I think there's parents here who can uh, also agree with me in hearing it from their students and their, their own children's friends, the children are not very happy about getting out early. They see this as a waste of time, and they would actually prefer to be in class. As a parent, I would highly suggest that we start using this time that they get out early to their advantage. And when our teachers are busy because they need extra time to grade or have continuing education, we need to look at other things we can do. If we can spend 10,000 on a service dog and we can spend 73,000 to send kids to Camp Miaconda, I think we can set aside some money or we can also ask members of our community, whether it's Perrysburg or Northwest Ohio, to come in and talk to our kids on careers. We could have a career fair, and we could put that in with English class for papers and presentations through all grade levels at the high school. We could have our kids do on-site experiences. We could have speakers in. We could also bring in a junior ROTC. We could bring in FFA into our school. We could have our students volunteer at our lower schools. This could foster aspiring teachers, or maybe kids who've never thought about teaching and find out that they love it. We can do better for our kids. We can do better for our community. We can do better with our resources, and we can do better with our money. I hope that we reevaluate what we're doing at the high school here in December and we make a move to quit letting our kids out early and we do something to improve our career and college scores for our report card. I'm going to leave you with this, some numbers to think about from the report card. Class of 2019, 80.1% of kids are not in college two years after they graduate from high school. Class of 2015, only 53.4% have graduated college within six years. Talking to a 2017 Thank you. That's, student. That's three minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. That ends the public the second public participation section. So item 17, uh, motion for adjournment. So moved. So, second. Ms. Larimer, Ms. Eubank, and roll call, please. Ms. Larimer. Yes. Mrs. Eubank. Yes. Dr. Rufford. Yes. Mr. Pullman. Yes. Mr. Bennington. Yes. We are adjourned. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. <gasps>